So in the second part of the introductory lecture, I will uh, talk about the historical roots of uh, environmental and natural resource economics. And, and then as another item, I will also uh, introduce you the very interesting result called uh, the cost theory that uh, relates to the property rights. So, um, of course, uh, environmental economics is a relatively uh, young subfield of the of the economics, but uh, economics as a, as an area has a quite long history, going back to at least to the to the Adam Smith's uh, famous work uh, Wealth of Nations uh, at the end of the the eighteenth century. Around the time of of uh, Smith's work, there's also another. Uh, famous classical economist called Thomas Malthus, uh, and uh, he was uh, writing on this on this issue of uh, population in 1798, and uh, this also gives this kind of famous concept of Malthusian trap. That uh, Malthus was arguing that uh, that uh, populations have a tendency to grow until the um, until this uh, this uh, resource uh, barriers uh, set in, and as a result, there's like a very very uh, and, and negative consequences that there it leads to war and famine and and uh, disease, uh, and uh, this kind of very pessimistic view also also led to the uh, notion of uh, economics as a, as a, as a dismal science. And of course, it's important to note that uh, that I mean, there's obviously this kind of relationship between to this kind of limits of growth discussion that also also we have uh, have uh, more more recently and even even nowadays that where where is this kind of uh, limits of the of the population that we face? Recall from the first video lesson this uh, this uh, discussion on the on the population growth. So these Malthus uh, ideas, of course, uh, are, are often often revived. Uh, another point to note here is that that, that of course uh, Malthus was writing before the uh, before the Industrial Revolution really really took place in the in, starting in the UK. So, of course, this kind of technological progress has been the reason why why then. Uh, uh, in 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 reality, the the human populations have actually managed to escape this Malthusian trap, and and that has led to this kind of uh, enormous growth in the in the in the human population. So, but that's of course very 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 like uh, like early early uh, treatment of this kind of population growth and population growth problem, and and what kind of uh, what kind of um, uh, enormous uh, human suffering can be caused by the by the the by this kind of um, uncontrolled uh, population growth. Now, then, although I have so far focused mainly on the on the uh, environmental issues, then there is this uh, um, subfield of uh, of natural resource economics, which is also very closely related to the to the environmental issues so so in some sense uh, if you think about environmental uh, problems mainly mainly as arising from the pollution then of course there is also the economy uh, in interfaces with the with the with the natural resources uh, and exploitation of the natural resources is also a major major issue so so nowadays, the the environmental economics and natural resource economics are considered as a as a as a one one field. And uh, the history of of um, modeling natural resources goes back at least to the to the German uh, uh, researcher Martin Faustmann. Uh, in eighteen forty nine, he he described this problem of uh, of um, optimal uh, optimal harvesting rule for for uh, for forest land uh, and this also this nowadays refers to as the as the Faustmann rule that describes the optimal time to harvest the forest when when uh, and and uh, this is supposed to be when the when the growth of forest equals its opportunity cost so i will aim to aim to come back to this in more detail and also also give you the the uh, more more uh, formal treatment with the with the equations, 
but uh, but the point here is to just uh, note that the, that this uh, treatment of this kind of um, forest management problem and of course forest can be thought of as this kind of sustainable uh, natural resource uh, that can be can be harvested uh, over and over again because the forest is growing so that dates back to the to the mid 19th century and also on this slide, I indicate two other German researchers from Gerens and Pressler, who also, also uh, around the same time were, were uh, considering the same, same uh, forest management problem and contributed to, to solving it. Uh, but later in the, in the 20th century, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, Faustmann's um, optimal harvesting rule was also taken taken or became uh, of interest to two to famous economists, uh, uh, Swedish economist Bertil Ullin in, uh, in uh, 1920s, and later the famous uh, American economist Paul Samuelson um, also wrote about it in the, in the 1970s. And uh, this kind of Faustmann rule is also, also still nowadays uh, uh, considered, and there's also several extensions to this and elaborations to this to this kind of uh, kind of optimal harvesting harvesting problem. So, so that also illustrates that this uh, this kind of issues have been have been thought already uh, a, a very long time. At the, that uh, that even though the uh, environmental and natural resource economics as a field is 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 newer. But uh, but these kind of issues have been have been considered also also before. So, of course, nowadays there is a great attention when we talk about the um, environmental issues that also like tax policy can be used to, uh, for example, introduction of environmental taxes is often often suggested as a as a way to to um, address the environmental problems and. And interestingly, the idea of, uh, of environmental taxes goes back to the 1920s book by Arthur Cecil Pigot, a title, The Economics of Welfare. And, uh, and therefore, nowadays, also this kind of environmental taxes are often referred to as Pigovian taxes. And uh, the basic idea is, is quite simple, that if there is some kind of... Uh, negative externalities to the to the society for example from the from the pollution then these negative externalities can be offset by a suitable tax that uh, that by taxing these extern these externalities then can can result as the societally um, more beneficial level of of pollution so so this also really shows that why this um, uh, environmental economics is very closely tied to the broader field of, of welfare economics. And, and, and we will also see it later in this course that, uh, that there is this kind of strong connotation with uh, or strong connections between environmental economics and welfare economics, going back to the time that, uh, that, uh, that there was not really, really uh, environmental economics as a separate subfield. And uh, also slightly before the emergence of the environmental economics as a, as a field, uh, there's also this very, very interesting and innovative uh, result known as the, as the Coase theorem. And uh, the Coase uh, theorem refers to the person called, called Ronald Coase, a famous American economist, uh, who wrote an article in 1960 titled The Problem of Social Cost. And uh, in that paper, uh, Ronald Coase uh, argues that uh, uh, if we have this kind of externality problem, so I'll come back to this definition of externality later, but, uh, but you can think about the externality, for example, the, the, the pollution. So Coase argues that if trading and externality is possible, and if the transaction costs are sufficiently low, then then uh, bargaining would lead to a Pareto efficient outcome, regardless of the initial allocation of property. So this is quite a, quite an interesting and and uh, and powerful result. So so let's uh, dive into this in a little bit more more detail. And and these kind of notions such as Pareto efficiency, I will come back to in more detail later in this course. So let's take an example that this uh, is often often used uh, in this context so 
think about the situation that there is a there is a farmer and then there is a, a, a fisherman and uh, the what is the issue here is that uh, that if the farmer is using uh, fertilizers uh, to to increase the growth of the of this uh, produce, then uh, there can be a problem with the runoff of fertilizers to nearby nearby lake or river in this case, and uh, and this uh, these fertilizers can cause then also also eutrophication of the of the river. Which is then bad for the for the fish, and then and then the fisherman is is hurt by this, and um, so therefore uh, we should find some kind of kind of um, uh, kind of societal uh, societally optimal compromise that uh, that the farmer shouldn't uh, overuse the fertilizers. Uh, but also take into account this uh, impact on the on the river and waterways and and this kind of negative impact on the on the on the on the fishing so what is then the argument here is that uh, that uh, that uh, problem in in many cases is that the, that the property rights are not uh, not uh, clearly defined and course is arguing that that that, um, that it doesn't really matter that which way the property rights are assigned as long as they are assigned so then there can be private bargaining between the stakeholders that will will result as this kind of societally efficient level of uh, of uh, pollution so here in this diagram there's there's uh, two two ways that the property property right could be assigned on the left hand side, we we see that uh, okay, if the um, if the fisherman owns the owns, owns the river, then the farmer could pay the fisher to to pollute the river with fertilizer. So in that case, if the if the fisher owns the river, then farmer could compensate for the for the damage caused by this uh, this uh, fertilizer runoff to the river, but still it would be able to use some some fertilizers. To, to grow this uh, this uh, vegetables for example on the other hand if the farmer owns the river then the compensation could be other way around that the fisherman pays the farmer to to not use excessive amounts of fertilizer so that there's there's still a possibility to do do fishing so the key argument here is that uh, that as long as this kind of property right is assigned, that who owns the river or who has the right uh, to to um, to be compensated for the for this uh, fertilizer runoff, then uh, then uh, bargaining between the fisher and the and the farmer will will result as the as the as the efficient outcome. The Problem here often is that uh, that when this uh, when this property right is not assigned, so so therefore then there's not even possibility to bargain about it, and it's not possible to pay this kind of uh, kind of compensations. Uh, so that uh, so that this is very often, of course, the situation in uh, in uh, developing countries or, or other countries where the government uh, is not very strong and and doesn't enforce the, the property rights. So in some sense, the first step. Uh, uh, here would be to 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 clearly assign the property right, and therefore then this kind of private bargaining would then then result uh, with the with the efficient outcome without any 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 other interference by the by the government except for this assigning the property right. So here's some some uh, further further notes on the on the cost theorem. So. Um, I already made this kind of this uh, this uh, point that uh, that uh, given a suitable assignment of property rights, then bargain, private bargaining can correct this kind of externality problem and lead to an efficient allocation. And again, read the externality as this kind of pollution problem. As an example, we come back to this concept of externality later. And a few points are worth to, worth to note here that uh, that. Um, that uh, indeed it doesn't matter if the property rights are assigned for the victim of the pollution or the generator of the pollution. 
Uh, however, the outcome will not be the same in both cases. Of course, it does matter that who is going to compensate whom. So definitely then, then uh, farmer would uh, would uh, would prefer to have the property to farmer would uh, would prefer to have the right to um, use the fertilizers, whereas uh, the the fisherman would prefer to have the right to ban this uh, this uh, fertilizers, and then then the uh, victim would be compensating uh, uh, or, or generating or the other way around. So of course, from the financial point of view, it does matter how the property right is assigned. And then another point is that, of course, that either way of assigning the property right doesn't necessarily seem like uh, like fair or equitable from both both parties. So we shouldn't also like uh, exaggerate the result. In any case, the most important or the starting point would be that the property right is somehow assigned so that uh, so that then this uh, this um, uh, individuals can can then then start bargaining um then of course uh, there is this one one important uh, issue about the the uh, transaction cost so so also then then of course if the bargaining is very costly then then it doesn't necessarily lead to the efficient solution um, for example, if there are many, many affected parties, uh, but if their if their costs are, are very, very small, for example, if there is uh, um, hundreds of uh, of uh, fishermen, but uh, only one farmer, and then the then the benefits of the fertilizer to the farmer are much more bigger than than the the damage to the to the fishers, so then then this can make this bargaining much more difficult. And then there is also also if if uh, if the bargaining takes place over public good, we will also discuss in more detail what is the public good later in the in the course. So here's another another illustration uh, uh, from from a cartoon called Dilbert. Uh, so to just uh, just to illustrate also the also the cost theorem that that that. Uh, of course, uh, there are also also this kind of uh, many kinds of social norms that uh, that sometimes then also prevent this kind of bargaining bargaining solution. It might might be, for example, considered uh, somewhat rude or inappropriate to offer some kind of cash payment as a compensation for some some environmental damage. And and these kind of cultural norms can be, of course, often the reason why this kind of uh, kind of uh, efficient bargaining solution uh, is not necessarily so socially acceptable as it as it might be for the for the uh, economist uh, who is who is uh, thinking about it. Uh, in any case, I think it is very very interesting to 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 be aware of this kind of cost uh, cost theorem and also also that. Point here is that where does it uh, where does it come from? So there is the person called uh, called um, um, Ronald Coase who who introduced this uh, this uh, this uh, interesting idea. So in the next video lesson, uh, we will then go to the theme of uh, sustainability, and the the I start with the origins of the sustainability problem. Thanks for your attention. See you in the next video.